Good evening, friends, and let me thank you for the opportunity to uh, minister God's Word. I appreciate the invitation um, from your church to do so this evening, uh, and I trust the Lord will bless us as we look into His Word once again. I'd hope to be with you uh, in person, but that's not possible just at the moment. But I trust that as you tune in, you'll be blessed as we consider uh, God's Word together. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to Genesis and chapter 8, first of all, and then a brief reading in chapter 9. But Genesis chapter 8 and verse 13, reading through to verse 21, first of all. Verse 13 of chapter 8, And it came to pass in the 600th and first year, and the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry, and in the second month, and on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons, and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful, and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth, after their kinds went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savour, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And into chapter 9 and down to verse 16, please. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. We know the Lord will bless the reading of his inspired word. I want to minister for a short time tonight under the title of A New Beginning. A New Beginning. Uh, we have entered a new year, uh, and that's the reason for me taking up this particular subject. I'm not one for um, New Year's resolutions or anything like that. But having said that, uh, at the start of a new year, it is good to take stock um, of what has been previously and uh, of our intentions, of course, for the future. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. In October 2019, Lego unveiled its first brand campaign since the 1980s. It was created by French agency BETC and it was entitled Rebuild the World. You may have seen the adverts on television. The huge project encompassed a live action adventure film directed by a multi award winning collective and a series of Lego brick scenes that sent positive political messages about the power of creativity to enable change. BETC themselves had met LEGO 18 months before and worked with the brand's internal agency to develop this whole concept of rebuild the world. They thought about what would be important for LEGO to say in the current day. BETC's founder, Remy Babinet, said they are one of the most loved brands in the world. Innovation and creativity are both brand and philosophy, but the problem LEGO has is that while it is known for the educational aspect of its product, that perception is a problem for all the parents who don't have an affinity with the brand. He said they think it's all about following instructions, but it's more than play or education, it's about creativity. To be creative today is the way to achieve something, to navigate the world. Mathematics and rationality used to be the most important skills but now creativity is the most valuable skill and Lego can enable that. He said, we had no limits. This film is about what your imagination can do with Lego. Rebuild the world could be just for fun or it could address issues in the world today. You can transform the world 
as you want. Now, friends, I'm quite sure that um, you know about this brand of Lego, this toy. I'm sure many of you have it in your homes or your grandchildren's homes. You've seen it, you've played with it, even yourselves uh, when you were younger. But there was a focus for this whole project of Rebuild the World, a focus on creativity. It was about innovation. They said rationality is not necessary. There are no limitations. Instructions don't have to be followed. Whenever we turn to Genesis 8 and 9, Noah's situation was very different. In a sense, he had to rebuild the world, but not with creativity, not with imagination, not with rationality, and not without limitations, and not without instructions. Genesis, of course, is the book of beginnings. And when we turn to chapter 8 and verse 13, we find a new beginning. Just by way of introduction, let's look briefly at some verses in chapter 7, if you want to cast your eye up to that chapter. If you look at verse 1 there, we read, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Righteousness in a wicked generation. That was his reputation. And today, friends, it must be ours as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. God said to Noah, come thou into the ark. Out of the world, in that sense, into the ark. And today we are separate from the world as believers in him. Separate in that sense, we are in Christ. Look at verse 4 of chapter 7. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. That was the promise of judgment. And friends, again, when we look around us today and when we read the scriptures, there's a promise of judgment even today. Verse 5 of chapter 7, And Noah did according to, unto all that the Lord had commanded him. That was faithfulness. And that same faithfulness is what is expected of us as believers today. We read in verse 16 of the chapter that they went in, they went in male and female of all flesh as God had commanded him and the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut him in. Noah would be the representative head of the human race. God would protect him but God was about to do something new. In verse 17 we see in the waters the, the flood was 40 days upon the earth and the waters increased and bare up the ark and it was lift up above the earth. The waters increased and bare up the ark. It was lifted up above the earth. It reminds us, does it not, of Christ. Lifted up above the earth. When judgment fell that day at Calvary and he endured it all on our behalf. There's six things that I want you to consider following that introduction tonight. Six things as Noah finds himself a very important part of this new beginning that we find in chapter 8. Look down at chapter 8 and verse 13 where we started off reading this evening, please. We read there, And it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month. It was the first day of a new year. It was a very new year. It was like nothing Noah or his family had experienced before. The ark had been completed. Noah and his family and the animals had entered. Judgment had fallen. The waters had subsided. He was about to disembark. This was a fresh start. He had been confined for a long time. Things had changed. He didn't know what lay ahead. The earth had never experienced anything like this before. He and seven other family members were alone in all this. And there was great responsibility. I wonder what you face as we have entered into a new year. What have you experienced in the year that has passed? We read here that the waters were dried up from off the earth. The conditions that had existed for so long had now changed. And we read that Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold the face of the ground was dry. The face of the ground was dry. God was renewing. 
we read that Noah looked and he looked and became conscious of the conditions. And surely this was an assessment. And that's a wise and a necessary practice. And I wonder, do you and I do it? Do we carry it out regularly regarding our own circumstances and in particular our own ministries? We need to do this individually and we need to do this collectively. What are the conditions that we face? Have they changed or are they changing as we enter a new year? Are we in danger of going through the mechanics of service? Are we in danger of the comfort of activity? And there can be a comfort in activity. We're busy, therefore we are faithful. But that's not necessarily the case, is it? The truth never changes. The message that we preach never changes. But our world and therefore our society is ever changing. It is ever on the decline, morally and spiritually. Every generation has had its challenges, but as we enter a new year, and indeed as we face more new challenges, and the prophetic words of Christ himself are clearer than ever, are they not? And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. There's much to learn from that passage in Luke 17, but suffice to say for now, man is going on in the things of this life, and in general does not believe the truth of God and is not heeding the warning of judgment. A judgment not by water, but by fire. And we're experiencing increasing antagonism against that message in order that it would be prevented and that we would be silenced. For men love darkness rather than light. Friends, those are the conditions if we take time to assess them. The question then is how do we respond to them? How do we address them? How do we prepare ourselves, our children, our young people to deal with them? Can you ask yourself and I ask myself, what have I done for the Lord in the year that has passed? Have I been faithful? And if there is a means of measurement, and sometimes there's not, but has it been effective? And will we resolve to be faithful in the year ahead? How can we do so? Well, we look at assessment, but when we can look at adherence, and that's how we can be faithful. Verse 14 of chapter 8, if you look there, we read, And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. The earth was now dry, not just the face of the earth. The earth was dry and could be inhabited. Verses 15 and 16, And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons, and thy sons' wives with thee. He didn't leave until God instructed him to do so. That was adherence to the word of God. That's what God had said. That's what he had instructed. He may well have been chomping at the bit to get out of that ark, but Noah had to wait. Delay can be difficult. But God knows best, and sometimes we have to wait. Preparation may be required. Maybe a time of study. Maybe a season of prayer. Maybe a time of practical preparation. And each of these requires our patience and our adherence to the word of God. Note Noah's family responsibilities. His wife was there. His sons were there. His sons' wives were there. They were with him as he entered these new conditions and as he went forth to carry out God's instructions. And we need to ensure we take <clears throat> our families with us. We need to make time for them. We need to live well before them. We need to be examples to them. And we have a grave responsibility to teach them. And that's before any Sunday school involvement or otherwise, to teach them ourselves the word of God. Noah faced a daunting task, a world that had been full, that was now empty. He had been part of a generation. Now he was to be the start of a generation. He had seen something that had never been seen before, and he was going to step out onto the earth in its aftermath. He had known the immediate protection of God in the close confines of the ark, and now God was asking him to go forth out of that vessel. I wonder, is God asking you to go forth? 
Will you do so, friend, with the indwelling of the Spirit of God, with the very presence of Christ and the revelation of God in your hand, the Scriptures? Assessment, adherence. Thirdly, think with me about acceptance. Verse 17 of chapter 8, Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. What did he bring with him? He brought some of the people and some of the things of the old world. There are things that we have to take with us. And you know what? They're not perfect, ourselves included. And we might not be able to change some of those things. And so we need to accept them. Circumstances, failures of the past, consequences, relationships, conditions. And we could go on with that list. But God was going to do something new. Genesis 9 and verse 2, we read, In the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. And you know, some of these things were very different conditions from what he had known before. And we read on that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. You see, the intention was for good. They were to be faithful. So rather, they were to be fruitful. And our desire would be that our service would be fruitful. But here is a warning. We must always be careful of the enemy. We need to be watchful alongside our service. The parable of the wheat and the tares in the New Testament, doesn't it remind us of the business and the craftiness of the wicked one? And friends, we must be watchful as we serve. Acceptance. Fourthly, think about adoration. That's what we see when we come to verse 20 of chapter 8. We read that Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Firstly, consider the context here. One family, Noah leading that family, the aftermath of judgment that they went out into, he could have focused on his own situation, but you know, he got his eye off himself. He got his eye onto the Lord. The one he had trusted in the face of coming judgment, he would trust for a new beginning. And something else for us to consider here is that there was no abundance, really, but Noah still offered sacrifice. Again, remember the context. One man, his wife, his three sons and their wives, animals sufficient to keep their seed alive on the earth. That's what they had with them. Everything else was destroyed. But Noah took of what was saved alive and offered sacrifice to the Lord of every clean beast and of every clean fowl. Sacrifice. It meant something. He put it on the altar. Everything else had been destroyed. He had taken a limited amount onto the ark, but he did not hold back. He sacrificed unto the Lord. Have you lost things in the past year? Have you lost things in recent years? Have you lost things over many years? Maybe possessions, maybe salary, maybe employment, maybe wealth, maybe friends or family or maybe health. The list could go on and on. But like Noah, will you still build an altar unto the Lord? Consider Noah's perspective, friends. His focus wasn't on what had been destroyed. His focus was on the grace of God. And thinking ahead, we don't know what will be in store for any of us through 2021. But will we resolve to learn from Noah's response? Will we follow his example? Will we offer sacrifice to the Lord? Will we worship the Lord as Noah did and thankfulness for his mercy and his grace toward us at all times and in all circumstances? Go on down to verses 20 to, sorry, 21 to 22 of chapter 8. And the Lord smelled a sweet savour, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living, as I have done, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, 
and day and night shall not cease. Note what man's condition had been like prior to the flood. The description that the Lord gives here is not much different and therefore the promise that follows only serves to emphasize his mercy. What a difference true sacrifice can make. On smelling that sweet savour from the sacrifice that Noah offered, the Lord promises not to curse the ground anymore for man's sake. What type of, sac of sacrifice was it? It was burnt offerings. They were for sin. And surely they pointed forward to Christ. And now we look back to that ultimate sacrifice for sin as we seek to be faithful to God. Paul said to the Ephesians, didn't they be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. Friends, are we serious about our walk with God and our sacrificial service unto him? Fifthly, we see assurance. We move into chapter 9. We look at those first seven verses and there we find the conditions of the covenant that God would now establish with Noah. Just to summarize, the conditions were this, to repopulate the earth, to have dominion over the animals which would now fear man. There was a new diet. Animals now becoming part of that diet. There, the eating of blood was forbidden. There, was, there would be capital punishment. And there was the promise that the earth would never again be destroyed by flood. Can, can we note the difference between this covenant and the covenant made with Adam? Adam was instructed to be fruitful and multiply on the earth and subdue it. Noah was not instructed to subdue it. This was not possible because of the fall. Can I encourage you, friends, to study the covenants that are found in Scripture? Mark the distinctions. Mark man's failure, but above all, discover the mercy and the grace of God as you read them and as you study them. We go down to verses 12 to 15 of chapter 9, and God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you, for perpetual generations, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. This was a promise of God for perpetual generations. It was the very assurance of God himself. The token of the covenant we know was the bow. And friends, note this. It is his bow. It's more than a scientific occurrence whenever it rains. It's an evidence of the mercy and the grace of God. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Put yourself in Noah's position again. He had come through the flood, a flood that had never been experienced before. The clouds had gathered and had broken and had unleashed a torrent in which every one but Noah and his immediate family had been destroyed. Every animal, other than what entered the ark, had been destroyed. Can you imagine having witnessed those events? How would you feel the next time the clouds gathered above you? But God provides assurance. He makes a promise. And friend, when clouds come, clouds of danger, clouds of despair, clouds of doubt, his grace remains and often becomes clearer to us against the backdrop of those clouds, his promises remain. Down to verse 16. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. We normally consider the rainbow from our perspective as we look upon it. And it's good to do so when we find assurance in that. However, note what God says here. I will look upon it. God looks upon the bow too. In fact, that is the perspective that is emphasized in these verses. God says, I will remember. I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant. What great assurance that we have in those scriptures. The God of all the earth has spoken. He has promised. He will be merciful. He will not recant. And that covenant is still in effect. It is an everlasting 
covenant. But we can also look to an even greater covenant that has been established. We look to the new covenant. That new covenant that was ratified at the cross where Christ endured the judgment of God in our place and the believer is redeemed and reconciled to God on the basis of that once for all sacrifice for sin, the covenant wherewith we are sanctified. Think finally with me about admonition. We see it in verses 20 to 21 of chapter 9. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Here's a warning, and it's a warning about sin. Even Noah, even after all that had happened, even after he had found grace in the eyes of the Lord, what a dreadful thing he did. What dreadful consequences that ensued. Friends, we rejoice in the grace of God, but we can't play fast and loose with it. The word of God is solemn. The word of God is serious and we are responsible. Our conduct is important. There are consequences for sin. The consequences of Noah's sin and Adam's sin and Abraham's sin and many more continue to this very day. And you know, ours will be no different. There's a danger that we can get lost in the wonder of the account of Noah because of the nature of the events that are recorded for us. But may we take a step back. May we understand the circumstances. May we realize the responsibilities that he faced and may we learn from them. He faced a new year like no other that has come around since. He faced a new beginning. And as we move into a new year, and perhaps a new beginning in some sense, may we learn from his experience. That we would have assessment of what has gone before and what we face going forward. That there would be adherence to the word of God. That there would be acceptance if we need it, of our circumstances, good or bad, that there would be adoration of the Lord of the Word, that we would have that assurance and, and relish it, the assurance and the mercy, the grace and the promises of the eternal God. And finally, that we'd remember this admonition to keep sin and temptation at bay, that we may remain faithful. I trust God will bless these thoughts from his Word to all of our hearts this evening. And I thank you once again for your attention and for the invitation to come and to minister God's word in this fashion. God bless you all.